It's February the 18th, 2021, and welcome to the Water Action Platform. Alongside the usual updates, our theme today is all about biosolids, or sewage sludge. I think this is possibly going to be my favourite session so far. In the tech showcases, we have two very different but very disruptive technologies. We also have Rick Lancaster from Atkins sharing his biosolids master planning experience, and we have an update from the ever wonderful Frank Rogala on the groundbreaking Horizon 2020 projects that he leads. I thank our sponsors for their continued support, without which we would not be able to share these updates. Last month, within a day or so of broadcasting, we posted the webinar on our website with Spanish subtitles. With over 600 views, this appears to have been a popular move. If you're watching this as a post-live recording, i.e. after the 18th of February, click on the CC box along the bar at the bottom of your screen to access the subtitles. If you'd like us to have subtitles for other languages, let us know and we'll do our best to get it sorted. However, as always, we start with a COVID slash water update. And today we have two chunky questions which are vexing many water quality specialists around the world. The first question is this, how comparable is wastewater based epidemiology data when compared between different sites or different labs? Now looking into this problem, Zhu et al undertook a survey to find out how widely SARS-CoV-2 RNA detection in wastewater is being used and what methods were being used. Around the same time, Pexon et al sought to identify if and how the results were impacted by the use of different approaches, such as sample concentration method or pasteurization pretreatment. Now, the aim of both of these studies was not to standardize on a single method, but rather to evaluate whether the 36 existing methods provide sufficient reliability and reproducibility to track trends. So what was the answer? Well, the researchers concluded that if you want to compare your data to data from another site where a different method was applied, you can have, drum roll, and 80% confidence that your method would have produced the same result. Now, the second big question for water quality scientists is whether we should be monitoring the influent wastewater or the primary sludge, which gives the best result. Graham and her co-workers studied SARS-CoV-2 RNA in both wastewater influent and primary sludge to see which harbored more of the viral targets. They found that primary sludge had the higher SARS-CoV-2 detection frequencies. They subsequently analyzed 89 sludge samples over a four month period and found strong positive correlations with COVID-19 clinical cases. The top graph here shows the confirmed new cases of COVID-19. The middle and bottom panels show the concentrations of N1 and N2 measured in the sludge solids. Together, the results demonstrate that measuring SARS-CoV-2 RNA concentrations in primary sludge may be a more sensitive approach than measuring it in the wastewater influent. So if you're a water quality scientist looking to use wastewater-based epidemiology to monitor future COVID-19 outbreaks, and let's face it, this is sadly probably something we will be doing for a good few years yet, please take note, sludge beats raw sewage. Now let's stay with COVID-19 uh, for a few more minutes, but look instead at the vaccines and their variants. Last month, Dr. Joe Burgess shared some fascinating insights into the whole vaccine topic, and we had so much positive feedback that we felt a further update might be helpful. You will no doubt recall that there are essentially three key variants which have grabbed the media attention. The South African variant, better known as 501v2, the Brazilian variant, better known as B1.B1.28-501.V3, and the UK variant, better known as B1.1.7-501Y.V1. It took me ages to learn those references. Seriously, who comes up with these names? Now, to help avoid you needing to remember those references, I will flag them on this rather handy summary table with their national flags. So let's start with the UK one. Now, keep in mind that each of these three variants have mutations on the spike protein. And this is important because it means the virus can mutate to make it smarter. Now, since the previous webinar, there have been two new pieces of information. On the 22nd of January, the expert panel NerveTag met to discuss new research on the UK variant. 
Previously, they'd reported that there was no increase in death from this new variant, but with more time comes more data, and we now know that the UK variant is 70% more transmissible. We also thought that this UK variant wasn't more deadly, but it is. A new study from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine found that if you're infected with this new variant, your risk of dying is around 35% higher. So, if you're a male aged 70 to 84, your risk of death increases from 4.7% to 6.1%. You might think that's small, but if you buy lottery tickets, ask yourself, would those stats change how you felt about your chances of winning? Moving on to the South African variant, we now have data from a small study by AstraZeneca, which concluded that their vaccine did not protect against this new variant. Out of 1,749 people in the trial, 39 fell ill with the new variant. 19 of those had received the vaccine, 20 had received the placebo, i.e. almost no difference between the two test populations. This would imply an efficacy of just 2% for the AstraZeneca vaccine against this new variant. Now, not surprisingly, South Africa immediately stopped distributing the AstraZeneca vaccine. This is major news, as South Africa had just had 1 million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine delivered that were intended for healthcare workers later this month. In the light of this news, it now looks like that South Africa's response is going to rely heavily on Johnson & Johnson's vaccine, which, based on initial trial data, has, another drum wrong, brrr, a 57% efficiency. Now, the aim of vaccinations is to make severe diseases into minor ones. So, if you think 57% doesn't sound very good, then consider that having this jab turns your potential five weeks in an ICU unit into five days of just having the sniffles. I thank Joe Burgess for providing me with that hopefully helpful vaccine update. We will keep them coming as things develop. But next we have this story on cyber security. This story got a lot of interest on our various Knowledge Hub forums, which of course anyone is welcome to join. Go to our website for the details. But in summary, a hacker gained remote access to a water system in Oldsmar, Florida, and changed the water chemical levels. Now, fortunately, an employee spotted it early and reversed the action, but the breach could have been very serious, and this highlights a growing area of concern for modern water utilities. So what are people doing to improve cybersecurity? Well, this slide highlights some of the actions that you might want to consider if this is an area of concern for you or your utility. It includes examples from across Europe and North America. I will circulate this slide deck later today with all the links. But this is clearly a very serious issue, which we will continue to monitor here at the Water Action platform. We now come to our sector expert interview. And this week we have Rick Lancaster from Atkins. Rick is the Bioresources Director and has worked on multiple biosolids master plans around the world. He has 32 years of water industry experience and has developed and implemented a number of international award-winning biosolid strategies. He's a member of the SIWEM and Clean Ganga Biosolid Steering Groups, and here is his three-minute mini lecture on biosolids master planning. So biosolids management is an incredibly important part of the water cycle. As uh, our wastewater treatment coverage increases, as our environmental standards become uh, more stringent, as our standard of living increases, as our economies grow, as our population density increases, um, as our connectivity to the sewers uh, develop, we'll produce more and more biosolids. And it's really important that we manage that in an efficient and effective way. We want to extract as much of the value as we possibly can out of it. We want to return the water, the carbon, the micronutrients and the nutrients back to the environment in a safe and sustainable way. We want to gain renewable energy from it. We want to collect resources from it. We want to extract that value. If we don't manage it efficiently and effectively, we risk polluting the environment. We risk operating costs going through the roof. We risk the potential for greater and greater carbon emissions through, uh, through biogas or through methane escaping. So it's really important to understand a simple question. Is this an ever ending problem or is it an increasing opportunity? 
Sewer sludge has evolved over time from a waste that nobody wanted. It was an arrow that pointed out at the back of the wastewater treatment works, now all the way through to it's a valuable resource. We've seen simple recovery of agricultural recycling through to adapting and supplementing the value within biosolids too, to further enhance its fertilizer properties. We've seen the simple capture of biogas and creation of energy through combined heat and power engines, through to development of fuels, biomethane, hydrogen, alter alternative fuel development. We've seen the simple treatment of wastewater and biosolids as a combined group of assets through to biosolids being treated as an independent, interconnected system with the greatest opportunity to enhance, optimise and in, improve the overall operating cost of that facility. We've seen simple resource recovery through nutrient recovery to agriculture, for example, right the way through to aggregates and ammonia for fuel cells and carbon sequestration. So it's a really developing area and it's a very exciting one. And there are so many different ways that we could go and so many different technologies that we could deploy that we really need to be careful about how we think about that first step. Atkins deploy biosolids or bioresources strategies all over the globe. Uh, more recently, we've been uh, undertaking a strategy review in a uh, mega city state in the Middle East, and we've deployed our master planning approach to that. And it's really important to understand the system, understand the baseline. What are our constraints? What are our opportunities within the environment that we are in, not what everyone else's environment is? We then need to understand what our ambition is. Where do we want to be? What are our key drivers and why are they our key drivers? And understand what those drivers are for change for us as an organization or as a, as a, as a community. That then allows us to start to identify some future state strategies that we would want to deploy and understand what our organization would need to look like to do that. What are our capabilities? How quickly do we want to do that and why? And then we can test those strategies against some future states, some future state environments from a regulatory perspective, for example. And once we've done that and we understand what our strategy is, then we need to develop our prioritized implementation strategy. What are we going to do first and why? What are the benefits to doing it in that way? Do we deploy a systems operator approach at this point to understand and maximize the benefits that we can achieve from this, from this biosolid system? We need to understand what the triggers are for change, how we accelerate, whether we deviate from the strategy that we've deployed. And then ultimately, we need to execute that plan. We need to understand what those steps are in that implementation strategy, the culture that we need to deploy within our organization, and how we sustain that change. And what the checkpoints are that we need to undertake to ensure that we monitor and we prepare ourselves in readiness for any deviation from that strategy. So that's Atkins' approach to master planning. Uh, very briefly, if you want to learn more, please, by all means, contact me uh, and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for that, Rick. Some great insights and learning shared there. Let's move to our technology showcases and we have two this week. The first one comes from Andean, a Vancouver-based business which has over 50, over the past 50 years, built multiple sludge and waste processing sites across the world. Now, recently, they've been working with the University of British Columbia on a novel way to enhance conventional sludge digestion, in particular using microwaves and very small doses of peroxide. Here is Danielle, Andean's CTO, sharing some more. The microwave advanced oxid oxidation process is an innovative solid destruction technology that uses microwave heating and a key powerful oxidant to effectively disintegrate solids raise nutrient for further recovery, and provide an ideal feed stream for accelerated anaerobic digestion and methane production. This technology is applicable to biosolids, food waste, dairy manure, algae, and any type of organic slurry. And it is a perfect fit for anaerobic digestion facilities which are seeking to improve their environmental performances. But how does it work? So microwave radiation is a proven technology for dielectric heating. That is a process in which a microwave electromagnetic radiation generates molecule, molecular rotation. This occurs in polar materials like water, having an electrical dipole moment, with the consequence that they will align themselves in an electromagnetic field. Those molecules rotate continuously by aligning with it. 
As it alternates, the molecules reverse direction by pushing, pulling, and colliding against each other, distributing the energy to adjacent particles, thus the temperature increase is obtained. Microwaves have been also proven in activating chemical processes. This technology utilizes a powerful oxidant like hydrogen peroxide to generate highly reactive hydroxy radicals that react with organic compounds and maximize the solid destruction and biodegradability. Now, the incoming sludge is mixed with a specific dose of hydrogen peroxide and then exposed to microwave radiation to activate the reaction. This heats the mixture and enhance the, hydrolys the hydrolysis of the solid particles. Uh, the microwave sludge can then be digested for biogas production and the liquid can undergo nutrient recovery like strobite production. There are several benefits of this technology. Uh, first, increasing solid extraction compared to conventional AD processes. Increase biogas production proportional to the incremental solid extraction. Uh, increase of sludge dewaterability. Uh, low operating temperature and pressure to reduce heat and electricity con uh, consumption compared to other THP technologies. Reduction of the hydraulic retention time of the digester down to 10 days. Uh, Pathogen-free digestate. Uh, this technology can be installed in existing facilities or for greenfield project. And finally, due to the lower operating temperature and pressure and increasing biogas production, this system has proven to be a positive energy generation technology. Uh, we do have two different configurations available for this technology, uh, as a pre-treatment or as a post-treatment. Thank you, Daniel. This could be one of those breakthrough technologies. The next step is to test it at an even larger scale. If you're interested in working with Andean as they further test, let me know. Our second technology showcase comes from Eliquo. Now, Eliquo has multiple solutions for water and wastewater treatment, having operated for over 30 years. But the technology presented here today is all about climate change. It is a little known fact that wastewater treatment is the fifth largest source of anthropogenic methane emissions and that over 75% of those emissions occur in sludge treatment. This is why Eliquo developed the LOVAC-P process. Digested sludge still contains considerable amounts of biogas and LOVAC-P captures this gas by vacuum degassing. Here is Nina Repich sharing more about how it works. Greenhouse gases have an irreversible negative impact on the worldwide temperature increase. One kilogram methane causes the same impact as 84 kilograms of CO2 over 20 years. The reduction of greenhouse gases is one of the most important challenges to save the future of our children. How can you avoid emissions at your WWTP? The most effective starting point is sludge treatment, where three quarters of the greenhouse emissions appear. When we started designing a vacuum degassing system, we calculated the theoretical amount of gas per cubic meter of sludge according to Henry's law. However, the results were astonishing. The amount of extracted gas was more than two times higher than the theoretical value. But why? Small gas bubbles stick to the solids in the sludge, unable to escape. Hence, the digested sludge contains dissolved gas and microbubbles. This residue gas will escape into the atmosphere in the sludge handling after your digester. You can imagine what happens in the digested sludge by looking at a glass with this sparkling water. The gas bubbles escape from the water. However, if you put a straw in it, the gas bubbles adhere to the surface, hindered to escape. This is what happens with the biogas bubbles and solids in the digested sludge. To extract these trapped biogas bubbles from the sludge, we develop Elevac P. Elevac P is a vacuum degassing technology for digested sludge with optional simultaneous phosphate precipitation. Here you can see how Elevac P works. Biosolids are continuously fed from the digester into the degassing reactor tank. A vacuum pump captures the entrapped biogas from the digested biosolids and brings this back into the gas system. The energy produced from this additional gas covers the Elevac power consumption. Optionally, magnesium is added to the reactor tank. Degassing increases the pH. Together, this creates the perfect environment for controlled phosphorus precipitation. Finally, the degassed biosolids are discharged for dewatering. 
after Ilovac there is no screw right scaling potential and better dewatering results are achieved whilst using less polymer. This way Ilovac helps you to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, reducing your operational costs. Wastewater treatment plants in Norway, the US and Germany already benefit from vacuum degassing with Ilovac. We have mobile full-scale Ilovac units available that you can test at your plant. Long story short, Ilovac P improves dewatering up to 5% points. Hence, the treatment plant saves up to 20% sludge disposal costs. In addition, it reduces maintenance. With precipitation, the phosphor in the biosolids, you also reduce the P-load on your water line. Hence, safe in iron chloride use. In a nutshell, it reduces the plant's carbon footprint by 25%. Join us in stopping climate change by reducing methane emissions at wastewater treatment plants. Isn't that incredible? What a great technology. This is a pretty simple plug and play technology which could bring substantial environmental and economic benefits. Eloquo is owned by Skion Water and I spoke with them last week about their commercial model. Skion would be delighted to talk to interested utilities about potential innovative funding models where perhaps the costs and benefits are shared with perhaps for example the utility keeping the benefit of the extra gas but Skion having the benefit of the carbon offset. If you want to know more let me know and we will connect you. Now rather than doing a third technology showcase we decided that this week we would have a specialist live interview. And I am delighted to introduce Frank Regala, Head of Research and Innovation at Aqualia, the Spanish water operator. Over the past few years, Frank and his team have led a number of the major Horizon 2020 projects. And I felt it might be good to hear how those projects have proceeded. Frank is currently in Madrid. Frank, are you there? Hey, Piers, beautiful spring day in Madrid. Brilliant. Great to connect with you again, Frank. Um, so uh, let's start. I know you've prepared some slides, but before we get to the slides, can I just ask for people in the audience who aren't familiar, what is Horizon 2020? Horizon 2020 was the big innovation program of the EU, where over a seven year span from 2014 on, the EU spent 80 billion euros worth, about 10 billion a year. And that wasn't all on water and wastewater. It was, of course, all through science, uh, from aeronautics to IT and biotechnology and medicine, whatever clever Europeans could think about. Excellent. Well, I know you've prepared some slides, so we're going to hand over the conch to you to present those. And maybe uh, at the end of that presentation, perhaps we can have a little Q&A. So, um, Frank, the slides are all yours. Great. Thanks, Piers. Uh, indeed, my first privilege when I started in 2008 was to look for funds to support our innovation and we in 2010 won this first all gas project which allowed us to show that actually we can harvest energy out of wastewater rather than pumping in 0.5 kilowatt hours of electricity you can get two kilowatt hours per cubic meter of energy and we can now drive cars only with wastewater biogas. Then, uh, obviously, we went, we went forward from that. So what else can you do with algae? Uh, since fuel is about the lowest commodity that there is, and currently we're finishing the Sabana project together with the University of Almeria to harvest all kinds of other value from the biomass, whether it's fertilizer, whether it's um, plastics or other bio products. And that also is now going to a large scale demonstration where we're building two more hectare facilities, as we had uh, built in Chiclana for all gas already two hectares of ponds. Now another two plants we equip with similar big ponds, just to show that we can actually harvest a lot of value from the wastewater. And uh, in, with that same idea of a phototrophic organism, we're also working with the University Ray Juan Carlos in Madrid with a different kind of phototrophic organism, the deep, the purple bacteria, and we call the project Deep Purple, because obviously, again, we want to harvest all kinds of value out of this new biomass that grows a little faster than algae and might be therefore more appropriate for some bigger facilities. And we're just operating this very large uh, first demo plant of about 400 cubic meters per day already and looking for the next demo site to upscale further. 
But not only do we harvest energy from wastewater and higher value products, the main energy consumption in water is desalination. And therefore we worked on this microbial desalination cell where you can actually use bacteria to desalinate without any external electricity input. So rather than spending three to four kilowatt hours of electricity per cubic meter, as in desalination today, you use wastewater energy, the bacteria get fed by organic matter and they can move the salts through the membranes without external input. So that we went all the way from lab scale to full scale demonstration. It's a process that we developed together with IMDEA, IMDEA Water, the research center in Madrid. And you can see here the first demo plants. We built one in uh, Denia on the coast uh, where we use brackish water. You can see here this desalination cell actually for 3.5 cubic meters per day uh, without e electricity produces desalinated water and clean reused water. And similarly in Tenerife, we went all the way to seawater and can also show that the same technology of microbial desalination can actually desalinate seawater without e external electricity. Now these are of course isolated processes. Now we want to solve our overall utility challenges and come up with a water cycle that is carbon free. And we were lucky enough to be one of the five big consortia uh, that responded or that got selected for this smart water economy project. And you can see here, we try to um, show the value of water in all its different ways, the value in water, extracting the materials, the value from water, creating new business from startups and from uh, di digital services, and the value through water, bringing new well-being to society. And of course, that we cannot do alone. It's what the largest project we ever realized. It's uh, 15 million EU support. And you can see here the large consortium that we put together. Thanks to the network of IELTS, we could uh, bring together various of their members from the TAG, for instance, Seven Trent, uh, Aquanet in Poland, or Vasud in Malmö, together, of course, with Aqualia and its various dependencies, even the Czech Republic. So you can see here that this project brings together five leading utilities to dream up a carbon-free water cycle. Frank, uh, that, that's brilliant. Thank you. I know how hard it was for you to try and whittle down all of the work you've done over the last 10 years into, into those few slides. And I just love the diversity of those projects from just as I thought you were going down a, a, a wastewater angle, you suddenly inject in that that microbial D cell. So when you look back at it, can you tell me what is it you're most proud of? Well, actually, I'm proud of a very simple fact that my car only drives with biomethane from our own wastewater treatment plants. Maybe I'm the only one in Madrid who has that privilege to have a completely carbon free car that only has to drive up to the treatment plant once a week. So just to be clear, you only run your car on biogas, biomethane that you've generated from the sewage works? Exclusively, yeah. And we actually now have equipped five different plants already with this biomethane upgrading so that we have uh, various fleets in uh, five cities that only drive with wastewater biomethane. Oh, that's fantastic. And so, so if that's what you're most proud of, what do you think will be the biggest practical outcome that comes from all these projects? Because we all know that in innovation, some things work and some things don't. Some things you learn from, you fall forwards, as it were. What do you think will be the biggest practical outcome from the projects that you've been involved in? Well, obviously, Rewise tries to bring together all the best ideas that we have to reduce the carbon footprint and the energy need of a water cycle. So hopefully in five years, we can show that our water cycle can be completely carbon neutral by optimizing each little step of our process. And the obsession around the world with, quite rightly, the obsession of trying to get, our, get to carbon neutral within water utilities, it would be fantastic if that could be uh, a pivot point for it. Well, so the Horizon 2020, the clue is in the name, 2020, and we're now in 2021. It begs the question, what next? Um, of course, the EU is very active to uh, learn from this program that was actually already a continuation of previous framework programs. And the newest one is now called Horizon Europe, 
and will run to 2026 and mobilize even more funds, close to 100 billion euros over this seven year period. Excellent. Well, um, Frank, thank you for your time. It is always a pleasure to speak with you. Um, my question, I guess, is that with Brexit, I have no idea whether European businesses, uh, whether UK businesses will be able to, to be part of that. Um, Frank, actually, before you disappear, do you have an answer for that question? I think it's still under negotiation. There are some other non-EU members like Switzerland, like Norway, like Israel, that do participate in the Horizon 2020 and also the Horizon Europe program. So I'm confident that the British yeah, may... will appreciate that. There may yet be some hope. Well, thank you very much, Frank. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Chris. So we now come to our last story of the day. And we have this rather nice one from North America about one of the benefits of the current lockdown. Now, I suspect it's fair to say that a fair proportion of this audience would normally travel overseas as part of their job, be it for international conferences or business meetings. Now, prior to the pandemic, this was probably seen as a necessary part or maybe even a perk of many jobs, and it has been put on hold for the last year. Well, before we rush back to the airport to do that long haul flight, perhaps we should pause and reflect on this study. Researchers from Oregon analyzed data from 22 teams during the NBA's recently truncated season. Now, a typical NBA basketball player flies up to 50,000 miles each season, often traversing across time zones. Now, these researchers found that the less travel the players did, the more improved their shooting accuracy was. Now, whether you're an international basketball star or, like me, simply have a desk job in the water sector, this is something to take note of. Andrew McHill, the study author and an occupational health scientist, commented that this finding, that the lack of sleep and time zone confusion affects your work, will apply just as strongly whether it is in a meeting room or indeed on a basketball court. I, for one, am quite enjoying not being jet lagged. With that, we come to the end of this week's webinar. I once again thank our sponsors for their ongoing support and all our speakers and contributors this week. I also thank you for your time. The next webinar will be on Thursday the 11th of March at the usual times. Megan will circulate calendar invites shortly. Keep asking questions, keep sharing, and keep safe.